Huh? Okay. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kathy Kramer. I'm a faculty member in the political science department here at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a proud affiliate of the Elections Research Center. And for those of you just joining us um, for the first time today, either in person or online, welcome. We're glad to have everybody here. So as you all know, we have a great panel in front of us. Um, I just want to remind folks in the room that if a question occurs to you as you're hearing our great speakers talk, please write it down on the index cards in the middle of your table. Someone will come around and collect those questions probably after both speakers have shared their thoughts with us. If you're joining us online, please submit your questions uh, via the Q&A function on Zoom. I will be watching those uh, as they come in. Thank you for doing that. And for everybody, if you're active on Twitter, please do tweet about this symposium. The hashtag is ERC22, which if you can see the screen is up here on the bottom right corner. So without further ado, let's launch in. So I'm going to introduce each of our speakers in turn, and then they will share their wisdom with us for some time. And then when they are both done, then we will engage in conversation Q&A with them. So first, we're going to hear from Travis Riddout. Travis Riddout is the Thomas S. Foley Distinguished Professor of Government and Public Policy in the School of Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs at Washington State University. He is also co-director of the Wesleyan Media Project, the go-to source for data on political advertising. Travis is a leading scholar of political communication. He's published three books on political advertising and numerous other studies that I know many of you are familiar with. And uh, I have a very soft place in my heart for Travis because I have had the joy of teaching here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison my entire career. And Travis was one of the first graduate students I met in that job. So when I joined the faculty here, Travis was a graduate student here. So Travis, welcome back to Madison. It's always a pleasure to learn from you and we're eager to, to hear your wisdom. So please join me in welcoming Travis. All right. Well, thank you, Kathy, for that very generous introduction. And it is indeed a pleasure to be here today. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the research I'm going to be talking about today is really a collaboration between myself and uh, two other Wisconsin alums, um, Michael Franz, who's now at Bowdoin College, and Erica Franklin Fowler at Wesleyan University, and together we are co-directors of the Wesleyan Media Project, and that project actually has its roots about a, a three-minute walk from here in North Hall um, in uh, 2000, the year 2000, the same year Kathy started, uh, Ken Goldstein started on faculty at Wisconsin and brought with him some political advertising tracking data. And I became interested in that. And that became the Wisconsin Advertising Project. And um, in 2010, Ken called up uh, Erica, Michael and I and said, I'm done tracking political data. I'm done tracking advertising. Do you wanna take over? We said, uh, and then we scrambled. We found some money and hence the Wesleyan Media Project was born. So since 2010, we've been tracking political advertising in the United States. Uh, we track broadcast television advertising, national cable, uh, national broadcast. Um, in more recent years, we've started tracking advertising on Facebook, on Google, um, including YouTube and on radio. And really the goal of the project is transparency. During election seasons, we want to make sure that that information about who is spending what on particular political ads is out there so that journalists can, can track the flow of that money. And then after elections, we want that information to be out there for 
the academics who study political campaigns and campaign finance and political communication. And so what I want to present to today are some uh, first cuts from our analysis of advertising in 2022. And so um, by some metrics, we had record television advertising in 2022. Uh, so the, the panel on the left shows advertising or the volume of advertising in house races in 2022, set a record about 1.4 million uh, unique airings. Um, we didn't quite set a record in the Senate race, uh, thanks to just the overwhelming amount of advertising in 2020, but certainly for a midterm year, we saw the highest volume ever of television advertising in Senate races. And if we look at gubernatorial races, we're also setting a record, at least for you know, comparable election cycles, about 1.8 million ad airings on television in gubernatorial races. And so in spite of the rise of online advertising, boy, those campaigns are sp still spending a lot of money on television. Um, let me look um, at some of the spending figures from 2022. Um, this is just for House, Senate, and gubernatorial ads. Um, we tracked $3.2 billion in spending on ads in, on broadcast television, uh, $866 million on political ads on cable TV, a mere $63 million on satellite TV, $164 million on radio for a total of $4.3 billion. Now, again, I'm not talking about online advertising here. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, let's take a closer look at the Senate. And so what this figure is showing is just the the number of Republican ad airings or pro-Republican ad airings in each state on the x-axis compared to the number of pro-Democratic ad airings on the y-axis. And so those states above the line are states in which there were more Democratic ads than Republican ads. And you'll notice that all of the competitive Senate races fall above that line. And sometimes the disparities were quite large. Um, in Arizona, for instance, there are about 90,000 pro-democratic ad airings in that Senate race, compared to about 30,000 pro-Republican ad airings. So um, Democrats really dominated in 2022 in those most competitive Senate races. Um, we started talking about the issue agenda in campaigns earlier on. Um, certainly you, see, you can see the rise in discussion of abortion in Democratic ads. Actually, this is House and Senate. Um, and you can see the fall off in Republican discussion of abortion over time. Um, early in the year, Republicans were mentioning abortion more in their political advertising. Of course, a lot of that was primary advertising, but that fell to almost nothing by election day. Um, Democrats were also talking about healthcare, traditional Democratic bread and butter issue during the campaign. Uh, what were Republicans talking about? Well, it was kind of a, a threefold argument on how massive government spending, which we titled the budget, has led to inflation, which is bad for the economy. And so kind of all three of those seem to be tied up together in a lot of the Republican advertising. Certainly we saw media reports that public safety and crime was a big issue for Republicans. Um, we find that towards the end of the campaign that it's mentioned in about 40% of Republican ad airings, but Democrats also didn't ignore the issue of crime. Uh, maybe about 20% of Democratic advertising throughout the campaign was focused on public safety and crime. Um, 
people seem to be interested in discussion of abortion in this campaign and how pivotal it may have been in the outcomes. Uh, I think it's important to know that there's a lot of variation by state in terms of how much abortion was discussed. And so um, this is showing you the proportion of political ads by party in each state that mentioned the issue of abortion, uh, sorted by um, Democratic mentions. Um, and the Democrats are shown in that, that dark dot, uh, Republicans shown in the gray diamond. And we, we tended to see the most discussion of abortion in fairly liberal states, uh, Maryland, Washington, Connecticut, Colorado, Oregon, and then in some of the swing states, um, such as Florida and Wisconsin. Um, and that I think makes sense. Um, Republicans discussed abortion more than Democrats in very few states, but the states in which that occurred, it was very conservative states. So Arkansas, Idaho, uh, North Dakota, and Oklahoma. This figure is showing you um, not only the volume of advertising by party over the course of the campaign, but also the tone of that advertising with those positive ads or promotional ads shown in the white. And I guess one takeaway from this is that, yeah, there was a lot more Democratic advertising in those Senate races than Republican advertising. And that was true every week of the general election campaign. The second takeaway is there wasn't actually that much positive advertising in this campaign. Uh, about half of the advertising in a typical week was purely negative advertising focused solely on the opponent, um, whereas another quarter tended to be contrast advertising uh, focused both on um, the favored candidate and the opponent. Let me talk about some house races. Uh, here's that same figure I showed before for Senate races. This is just for lean Democratic House seats. And in almost all of those seats, Democrats had an advantage in terms of total advertising. Uh, if we look at those toss-up House seats, again, it looks like about two thirds of those toss-up seats Democrats had an advantage in terms of the volume of advertising. Uh, what if we look at those lean Republican seats? Uh, here, Republicans had more of an advantage, but in about half of these races, we saw more advertising uh, in favor of the Democratic candidate than in favor of the Republican candidate. And so certainly the narrative has been out there that uh, Democrats made a strategic mistake. They were cutting back on advertising in various races. And that may be true, but if we even look at the toss-up House seats in the final two weeks of the campaign, in the vast majority of those, there was more pro-Democratic advertising than pro-Republican advertising. Um, so throughout the campaign, it seems Democrats had an advantage in the majority of House races. Um, here's the same figure uh, for the tone of House races. Again, um, very little purely positive advertising regardless of the party. Uh, Democrats seem to be slightly more positive than Republicans in this race, which is, it's typical that the out party is more negative, but towards the end of the campaign, it was really only about 20, 25% of the ads that were actually positive ads, with the vast majority being pure negative ads. Let me talk a little bit about digital advertising. Um, this figure, well, table, is showing you digital spending on Facebook, including Instagram, and Google, including YouTube and Google search. Um, this is by candidates and their kind of official super PACs, I'll put that in quotes. 
And um, since uh, January of 21, so the entire election cycle, basically excluding that, that Georgia runoff race, which we give credit to the previous election cycle for, um, we saw about 53 million in digital advertising on these platforms in Senate in House races, 95 million in Senate races for a total of about, of about $150 million in digital spending. Now, this is a vast underestimate of total digital spending. For one, it does not include spending by political parties or interest groups on digital advertising. Um, do you know how difficult it is to figure out how much an interest group spent on digital advertising in a particular race? It is very difficult to figure that out. We've been working on computational approaches to figure that out over the past year. I think we're getting close, but it's a very, very difficult thing to handle. Um, the other thing, of course, is that Facebook and Google, though the biggest players in um, the political ad game online, are not the only players, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of third-party advertising anecdotally, I've heard that their share of the total online advertising space has declined considerably in 2022 um, compared to the previous couple of elections. And so what's the, what's the size of the total digital ad space? It's hard to say. Um, one thing we can do though, is estimate the percent of digital spending in Senate races. So your numerator here is the amount spent by each of those candidates on Facebook and Google. The denominator is that amount plus how much they spent on television advertising. And so that's how we define percent digital for the purposes of this figure. Um, that was 11% in 2018, 19% in 2020, and up to 27% in 2022. And so even though spending on television advertising is robust, we're seeing increasing, an increasing percentage of their ad budgets going to digital. So who were the top digital spenders in the Senate? Um, maybe not a surprise, our, our friend Raphael Warnock from Georgia, 15.7 uh, million in digital spending this cycle. Um, that actually ends on election day. We're not counting um, what is being spent in the runoff race. Uh, Val Demings in Florida, number two. Mark Kelly in Arizona, number three. John Pet Fetterman in Pennsylvania, uh, number four. Uh, what you'll see, what these candidates have in common, they're Democrats. Only two of the top digital spenders in Senate races this cycle were Republicans. Excuse me. Um, we also did some classification of these digital advertisements in terms of their goals. And so we wanted to know how many of those, these ads are actually aimed at persuasion versus fundraising versus get out the vote, supply and information, so on and so forth. And so this shows the top Senate candidates in terms of the proportion of their ads that are aimed at fundraising. And so you can see for a candidate like uh, J.D. Vance in Ohio, over 90% of the digital ads that he, that he, I shouldn't say aired, but placed, um, <clears throat> were aimed at fundraising. Um, a lot of variation across campaigns, obviously, and I'm not showing other campaigns for which this is below half of their uh, digital advertising spending, but still um, lots of variation in fundraising. Also a lot of variation in the proportion of the advertisements, digital advertisements that were um, 
that were placed outside the state in which the candidate was running. So uh, Dr. Oz, uh, over 80% of the digital ads that he placed were placed outside of the state of Pennsylvania. Maybe they were all in New Jersey. I don't know. Um, but you see, for a lot of these candidates, their digital advertising is not aimed at the state in which they're running. It's aimed at another state. And thus, it should be no surprise if we compare the proportion of ads that are, well, thanks, Shannon. If we compare the proportion of ads that are aired out of state versus the proportion of ads that seek to raise money, there is a strong, pretty positive relationship between the two. Okay, let me talk a little bit about interest group advertising in 2022. Uh, so the left panel is for the House, the right panel is for the Senate. Um, the, the dark boxes show the percentage of ad airings on television that were sponsored by interest groups. The triangle line shows the percentage that was sponsored by parties. Um, and if we look at house races, you'll see that as recently as 2016, only 15% of ads in house races were sponsored by interest groups. I think what's most remarkable is the huge jump that we saw in 2022, up to about 34% of ads aired in house races this year were sponsored by interest groups. And so it seems like the house pattern is starting to resemble the Senate pattern only about three or four election cycles later, where interest groups are playing an increasingly important role in funding television ads. And, and I think this is reflective of the nationalization of our politics as well. If we look at uh, the group types that are active in federal races, obviously that has changed over time as our campaign finance laws have changed. But um, 2022 is pretty similar to 2020. Uh, about 20% of the ad airings were sponsored by 501Cs. Super PACs accounted for the bulk of the advertising and then carry packs or hybrid packs, which can do, uh, let's see, make unlimited independent expenditures, but also donate to campaign committees. Uh, they constituted about 15% of the advertising in 2022. Um, this figure is showing group disclosure by week in the Senate and, um, so the, the dark portion of the bars is showing dark money, undisclosed money. Uh, the gray is, is showing partially disclosed money. Generally, this is a group that reports that it received money from this other group, but we don't know where that other group got its money. And then the white is showing those groups that are fully disclosing their donors. And I guess the first point to make is there are very few of those full disclosure groups out there in 2022. We saw more of that very early on in the campaign. Um, the other thing though, is that that, that 60 day window um, before election day really matters, which those reporting requirements kick in. Uh, those dark money groups just basically stopped advertising so that they would not have to disclose where their money was coming from. All right, so a few takeaways on political advertising in 2022. Uh, we saw Democratic ad advantages in the House and in the Senate, and that's actually quite similar to 2018 and 2020, where we saw similar Democratic ad advantages. And my suspicion is this, that this is a reflection of a lot of small money donors on the Democratic side who are willing to 
put in $100 or $500 to a variety of races across the country. They aren't just donating to the races in their own states. And so a lot of these campaigns um, that are competitive have tons of money to deal with. Um, abortion was a key issue on the Democratic side in 2022, whereas this argument about inflation, the economy, and government spending was key on the Republican side. Uh, we definitely saw an increase in digital ad spending, at least as measured by the percentage of advertising that the average Senate campaign was devoting to digital. And the fourth takeaway is that group spending was up considerably in House races in 2022. Again, I think this is a, a reflection of the nationalization of our political campaigns. So these House campaigns are coming to resemble our Senate campaigns. And so I will leave it at that. Thank you so much, Travis. That was fantastic. Thank you for being here and for sharing this awesome data with us. And we're so glad you continue to run that project and collect that data. It's just a treasure trove, so thank you. Now we will hear from Shannon McGregor. So Shannon McGregor is an assistant professor at the Hussman School of Journalism and Media and a senior researcher with the Center for Information Technology and Public Life. Uh, both are at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Shannon is widely known as well for her work in political communication. She's just widely known and respected for her leadership in the study of social media and politics, which she's studied from many different angles. Um, she's just published very widely. Uh, you might know her co-edited book with Talia Stroud um, called Digital Discussions, How Big Data Informs Political Communication. And um, it's just a joy to have her here in person. And I also want to give a shout out to recent work that she's done um, with respect to gender equality in academia. And so as a sister, I just want to say thank you for your willingness to speak out on behalf of people and um, your ability to draw attention to the need to not just tell people to buck up and be resilient, but uh, to draw attention to the institutional changes that need to take place, such as paid family leave. So join me, please, in welcoming Shannon to the stage. Give me a sec to get my little thing set up here. Or I can't find the mouse. It's like not showing up if anyone else wants to look. I feel like. <laughs> oh, it's on this screen. screen. Okay, okay, so maybe we need to go. Well, oh, if you look down there, can you see it down there? Yeah, I know, but I have. Okay, yeah. here we are. Thank okay. you. Okay, okay, now I can close this. Thank you. Yeah, and now I love it. I'm dragging it over. It's what? To the right. And then go to the I lost it. Yeah, I just can't find the mouse. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay, sorry, thank you. Um, I wanna start out by saying thank you uh, to everyone for having me here, especially to Barry Burden uh, and everyone at the Election Research Center for inviting me. For the staff and for the graduate students like Levi who made this event possible and who just <clears throat> helped me figure out how to slide something across the screen. Um, and thank you to Travis uh, for teeing up this discussion uh, with such robust and amazing data that like Kathy, I am so grateful that you all continue to collect and analyze. It's an amazing and important research. Um, so I want to talk today uh, with this wonderful sort of foundation laid about political campaigns, about social media, um, about how that sort of interacts with journalism, and what that leads me to be thinking about in terms of uh, conceptualizing what a, an identitarian citizen uh, means in terms of a democracy. So what do we know about how candidates use social media? Uh, we know they use it both in advertising, uh, as a lot of the data that Travis showed earlier, um, but we also know that they use it in, orga in organic posts, right? But across both of those, there's a lot of variation in terms of how do campaigns think about putting their candidate and, and, and how they're going to be on social media. Um, based on in-depth uh, interviews that I did with my colleagues, Daniel Kreese and Regina Lawrence, uh, we find that um, with people who are digital or communication directors uh, who run presidential campaigns, we found that these really vary based on a couple of things. One, the candidate themselves. What is their persona like? How comfortable they, are they on different social media platforms? How they use different platforms varies by who they perceive the audiences to be. What are the demographics? What are the type of engagement that they're going to be getting across different platforms? We also see that they make these decisions based on what are the perceived affordances of a particular platform, uh, both what they can actually do, like where is it easier to click a link until recently, not on Instagram, uh, but also the sort of perceived functionalities, right? What is a particular platform for? For example, Twitter is sort of still is like for interacting with journalists and Facebook is sort of for interacting with your constituents uh, or interest groups. Um, what kind of genres of communication are appropriate on different platforms? If you put a lot of text on Instagram, it's gonna look like you don't really understand what Instagram is for, right? Um, if you're taking TikTok really seriously, it's like you're not gonna know what TikTok is for, right? So the genres of communication vary across platforms. And of course, as I think we saw in some of the uh, data that Travis presented, timing really matters as well. Decisions about which platform to use in which ways vary by cycle, vary by, they're very temporally sensitive. Are we in the primary? Are we in the general? Is the goal fundraising? Is it getting out the vote? And we see that there's real temporal patterns in those. Um, but uh, I want to briefly mention a little bit some other issues uh, that we saw in political social media campaigns. This work is from Pew, so we can see, similar to many of the other uh, discussions that we've had today, uh, that abortion issues around the economy um, are, are often mentioned, and this is by tweets uh, uh, by political candidates. Um, even when Republican and Democratic candidates were talking about the same issues, we can see in the figure on the um, other side that they're using different words, right? So Democrats, when they're talking about race, are talking about systemic racism, white supremacy. Republicans, when they're talking about race, are talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, critical race theory, and so-called woke culture. Um, but I'm going to use Pew's other finding that they don't have a visualization for to pivot to my argument and, and how I can show you that actually political ads and political posts on social media are primarily not about issues. They're about identity. So in the same Pew study, they find that nearly two thirds of all tweets from candidates who were running for office in 2022 didn't mention any of these 16 issues at all. Uh, most of the Twitter conversation among political candidates focused on something else than these substantive issues. Um, I think that they focused on identity, both on Twitter and, and other platforms as well. And so uh, also with my colleagues, Regina Lawrence and Daniel Kreese, we have, as of course, political communication scholars thought about the role of communication in all this. And we think that media and social media are really central to constructing and conveying the identity of parties and of candidates, as well as the groups of constituents that they seek to represent. 
and that, that this communication is not information just about the policies that they will pursue. Um, and so we think uh, we have been calling this this idea of identity ownership. Um, this builds from a sort of strong constructivist argument in that identities are not necessarily stayed things, right? They have to be communicatively and institutionally maintained. Some identities, of course, are more durable, like race or ethnicity, but those can change too. For example, in the US, Italians only became white uh, in the 1950s, and some sociologists argue that Latinos will one day in, in become to be seen as white in the US context as well. And elections and election communication are a part of this process, right? In defining what groups exist in the society and which ones are legitimate bases for political action. And this idea of identity ownership any given election, with the hope that voters associate then parties and candidates with particular social groups to their own electoral advantage. Um, and this draws from the work in political science about issue ownership, where some parties are seen as more competent uh, with issues versus another, as we saw in, in some of Travis's, right? Republicans were stressing inflation in the economy because they are generally seen uh, by voters of all stripes to be better at handling that, right? Democrats are, are talking more about healthcare because they have been traditionally seen by voters to be more competent uh, in this area. But I would argue it's the same for identities and the type of identities that candidates and parties are displaying in their ads, trying to make the same argument of making some identities salient and others not as salient so that elections might indeed then turn on those particular social groups or identities. Um, we saw this uh, as what Trump did in making whiteness a very salient identity in the 2016 election, uh, which many scholars have argued definitely did contribute to his electoral success. So what does this mean if we think about campaign communication, especially on social media, through this lens of identity? What is that? How does that change how we might think about it? Well, we might look at ads instead of saying this is just about science as an issue, that this is instead about a social identity that is sort of constructed upon the idea that being for science is part of what it means to be a Democrat, right? Um, we can see also here a candidate, Pete Buttigieg, in this case, using his own identity as a gay man to communicate that that is a group, right, that he will represent. And that's certainly one more aligned, as we would see in this country, with the Democratic Party. We also can think about seeing uh, political ads on social media as showing candidates as prototypes. Uh, and this is built from the work on prototypic prototypicality. Um, and so we say that identity ownership is really on display when candidates portray themselves as fitting into these prototypes of these owned identities. Um, so we see Ted Cruz here praying backstage before a campaign with his family in an image that would be widely and instantly recognizable to someone else deeply involved in the evangelical Christian faith. Um, celebrities are also a part of this prototypicality. Um, you might recall uh, Donald Trump posing with the Duck Dynasty uh, fellows uh, as a measure of this, and also here uh, Chuck Norris uh, standing in a sort of a prototypical masculine sort of uh, uh, person helping Carrie Lake sort of round out <laughs> her image uh, in this way. Uh, and so we might also think about how candidates use this to make certain in-group salient, uh, Herschel Walker here with the police, as well uh, as using Hispanic language uh, in their images from the democratic side of things. We of course also see this in the way that candidates use these sort of social media posts and advertisement to make out-group salient, to say not only this is who we will represent, but this is who we are not. For, right? So this is sort of the more negative side of things as I think we also saw um, in some of Travis's work as well. And I'm working on, uh, well, I've developed a code book where we're trying to figure out how to code uh, political ads on social media through this lens of identity. Um, and I hope to be able to, uh, once my amazing uh, cadre of undergrad uh, research assistants helps me finish working out the sort of test proofs of it, be able to share more with you about that in the future. And I wanted to talk about identity because I think identity is really key to two strategic disinformation campaigns. 
that we saw across social media in the 2022 election. And the first one is, of course, election denialism. Uh, this is the idea of promoting disinformation about elections that undermine our democracy. Uh, and that it turns out these are really profitable for candidates and for social media platforms, as some analysis has shown that these posts got more engagement than others across various social media platforms. Most election or most social media platforms uh, basically stopped uh, moderating uh, election disinformation uh, shortly after January 2021. Many of them have not ramped that up, even as we went into 2022 here. Um, and a lot of platforms claim that their civic integrity policies only apply in very specifically defined current election cycles, um, which sort of flies in the face of the reality of how people's beliefs and coalitions are formed, which are not just from September to November, as it turns out, as we saw in the spending, <laughs> you know, all across the sort of very long election cycle. Um, and an analysis by Bloomberg found that candidates who pushed the falsehood of the 2020 election as being stolen, routinely saw their posts collecting more engagement across social media platforms overall um, compared to the performance of each candidate's average post. Uh, and this is looking at both Facebook and Twitter and Instagram um, and social media companies, which have alerted users about election falsehoods in the past, did not add any context in any of the posts that Bloomberg reviewed for this analysis um, as, in as far as these misleading posts went. And so what this means is that social media platforms who do not regulate this content in candidates' social media posts, whether they be organic or paid, um, are complicit, maybe even active participants in what we saw across platforms as sort of an assault on our democracy and the way that our election systems work. And the second related disinformation campaign that was really prominent across social media in 2022 is the targeted identity-based attacks on candidates and elected uh, members of Congress or state elected officials. Um, so I want to give a huge shout out um, to the Center for Democracy and Technology, who did a um, rigorous, although dis, very disheartening, report about this. Um, and they find that uh, women of color candidates were twice as likely as other candidates to be targeted with or be the subject of mis or disinformation across social media. Although women of color candidates were not the most likely target of overall uh, online abuse, white men were when we're looking just at sheer volume, um, they are the most likely to be the target of particular forms of online abuse, including sexist abuse, more so as compared to white women, racist abuse, more so as compared to men of color, and violent abuse in which women candidates of color were four times more than white candidates and two times more likely than men of color to be targeted on social media platforms with violent abuse. Women of color candidates were also five times more likely than other candidates to be targeted with tweets related to their identity that focus specifically on the intersection between their gender and their race. So using a candidate's own identity to attack them is, is another sort of disinformation tactic uh, that we saw across social media platforms uh, that I think are worrisome from a, a democratic, small d, democratic perspective. Um, and so I think all of this sort of suggests that election denying, harassment, the regular day-to-day -day campaigning of, of candidates are all fundamentally about identity. Um, for a long time, the informational elements of democracy have animated communication and political science research and public conversation. Um, scholars studying political communication and, and journalists and think tanks analyzing it have often thought about this through the lens of the progressive era ideal of the informational based citizen, um, which provides this really nice simultaneously normative and empirical understanding of democracy that's really deeply embedded in our sort of public thinking around what does it mean to be a citizen in a democracy and in particular in the US democracy. Um, but we don't just exist with social media and campaigns. All of this interacts with another institution important to democracy, which I want to touch briefly on, which is the press. Um, so many uh, GOP candidates uh, in the 2022 election were outright refusing mainstream media requests for interviews, 
Um, and so we see in these latter years of the Trump administration, these outlets experience upticks in the number of interviews granted to them by GOP members of Congress. Um, but I wanna end on a little bit of a hopeful note. Though uh, uh, analysis by folks at the German Marshall Fund found that national media outlets overwhelmingly um, disproportionately covered prominent election deniers, um, there are there may be some solutions here in terms of mitigating some of this. So I want to preview just very briefly findings um, from an experiment I fielded with my colleague Eric Peterson at Rice University. Um, and I want to talk about what motivated us to do this study. Um, so what might a democratically resilient model of the press look like when they're in this moment where candidates and parties are primarily communicating about identity? A lot of that can be very powerful motivator, and I would say it in a positive pro-social, pro-small D democratic way. But as we also can see, a lot of that can be used very illiberally or anti-democratically, right? To engage in strategic disinformation campaigns, to deny the legitimate results of an election, or to attack and abuse um, members of Congress or, or candidates. Um, and so what might a democratically resilient model of the press look like? Um, there has been an idea of public journalism uh, where press coverage draws from and at times may be even created in cooperation uh, with citizens. So scholars who advocate for this would say that press coverage like this would center citizens' concerns rather than those of candidates or of elected officials. But I think this would fail to meet our moment now uh, where centering the concerns of millions of Americans might also legitimate election lies and, and authoritarian tendencies. Um, so whether journalists uh, are centering the reporting on elected officials or candidates or everyday Americans, um, depending on, on the region they're covering, they can be faced with a nearly impossible choice when it comes to covering some of these uh, Republican and conservative candidates. If you cover them, you may be legitimating, you know, very authoritarian or racist or misogynist ideas. Um, but if you don't cover them, then you're not providing the service that you believe is at the heart of journalism, which is to inform people about what is happening in a particular campaign. Um, and, you know, again, this is becoming a problem, even that's exacerbated more when candidates are not actually even interacting with the press at all. So instead, we thought about what about the idea of democracy centered journalism? Um, so the press and journalists uh, are key pillars in a democracy and meaning makers in our culture. And as such, I, I would argue that journalists should deliberately and diligently center their work towards democracy, which means things like clearly and repeatedly covering uh, any candidates attempts to eviscerate the foundations of our democracy through things like voter suppression, minority rule, and putting election administration under partisan control, something I know that you are familiar with here in Wisconsin. Uh, it would mean things like positioning the weaponization of terms like free speech and critical race theory as disinformative narratives designed to erode a liberal democracy. It would mean taking seriously this idea that when a government fails to represent a legitimate source of opinion, then the press would point that out. So to examine this, um, we wanted to test the effects of sending journalists who were working at local outlets, um, who were covering congressional races, a little tip sheet on how to cover candidates who may be undermining democracy. Um, so we uh, sent out 2,500 invitations to, again, local journalists covering uh, congressional races um, that we identified through Google News Search and from Cision, which is like a PR firm where you can get journalists emails. Um, and we sent them an email on October 31st and a couple of reminders, so highly salient right before the election. Um, and ultimately we had about a 10% response rate, a little bit over 250 journalists responded to us. Um, and they were either put in sort of a control group where we gave them a little uh, tip sheet based on you know research and best journalistic practices about covering polls. And then we did another one that was like, well, here's what it might be like to do this really hard thing, which is to cover candidates who 
are denying the uh, mechanisms that hold them uh, accountable at all. Um, and so they either saw one of those, um, and I'll show you a little example of what those looked like in a second. And what we wanted to measure was how this affected uh, 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 how journalists would sort of prioritize different values um, when covering election denial. So um, avoiding amplifying false claims versus that we should let politicians explain their views no matter what. Um, we asked a couple items uh, about how journalists would rate relevant information sources regarding election denialism, such as the 538 graphic <laughs> that I had up earlier that showed which candidates were election deniers. Uh, we asked five items where we they evaluated sort of how appropriate they thought headlines were in terms of how they were framed around um, election denialism. And then finally, two items were asking how important it would be uh, for them to cover the votes that the, the candidates that they um, were covering if they were incumbents, um, how they voted in certifying the 2020 presidential election and on the Electoral Account Reform Act. So we gave them three uh, little tips, and, and this is just one of them, um, and all of them sort of uh, were uh, trying to say, um, this is a really hard thing to do. Here's an example of what it might look like, and these were all examples that, of course, actually happened, uh, things to avoid, and, and other things to think about instead. And so what we found um, is that... <laughs> This is a quote from one of the journalists. <laughs> uh, so what we found was that journalists who did see this democracy tip sheet um, did, uh, compared to those who just saw the polling tip sheet, uh, perform sort of much better on this idea of coverage decisions and the importance of, vote, uh, of reporting a candidate's roll call vote uh, and certifying the election. Um, journalists mostly rated the tip sheet as uh, useful and providing some new information. We also collected open-ended responses from the journalists um, and uh, got some great information from there. So journalists uh, said that this might be a good tool to share with their editors because covering something like this might be difficult for them to just do on their own, but maybe if they can show that there's research about this, you know, it can it, it can help their editors. A lot of them discussed that it would be like really hard to report like this in their district. Um, because they felt like uh, it would look really partisan. Um, and a lot of them expressed uh, what I'm calling this sort of third journalism effect. So uh, journalists who reported being like more experienced were like, yeah, well, I know this, but this is like a really important thing for newer journalists to see. Um, and then journalists who reported being younger and newer to the profession said, well, we're already reporting like this, but this might be really good for journalists who've been around a long time and are sort of like hemmed in with these sort of outdated notions of objectivity. Um, and one journalist said, the fact that this is even necessary demonstrates what a shit sandwich we're about to step into. So I think we'll be titling this study, What a Shit Sandwich, Journalists Struggle to Cover Election Denying Candidates. Um, so just to wrap up, um, one last benefit of thinking about a democracy-centered journalism, as I see it, is repositioning polarization as an effective frame in which we would discuss as an effective and objective frame in which we would discuss politics. We've heard a lot about that today. But I think it means understanding that journalism or that polarization may not be in and of itself something that we should fear. Uh, in a recent piece with my colleague, Daniel Kreese at UNC, we've argued that polarization can really only be seen as a central threat to democracy if we ignore inequality. Political identities more or less map onto social groups. Groups, in turn, are located within social structures. And as such, scholars, practitioners, journalists uh, should really be analyzing and understanding groups as they are embedded in relations of power to meaningfully evaluate the democratic consequences of polarization. Groups that are struggling for equality, such as the Black Lives Matter movement, necessarily cause polarization because they threaten the extant power and status of dominant groups. Thank you. So thank you both so, so very much. And political advertising is just such an interesting reflection of our politics and our US culture. And um, you've both given us so much to dive into. So thank you both for great presentations.
And just a reminder, those of you in the room, if you have a question for our speakers, please just submit it um, by writing your question on a card in the middle of the table. And then Levi and Veronica walking around the room will collect them from you. If you're joining us online, hello and thank you. Uh, please submit your questions via the Q&A function in Zoom and I see your questions rolling through. So thank you so much. To start us off, I, I have a question for each of you. I'm sure I will have more, um, but Travis, it, this might be more of a clarification, but as you were speaking, I was wondering whether the, the relative um, advantage of Democratic candidates in television advertising might be because Republican candidates were spending more digitally, but it certainly didn't seem that way with respect to Senate candidates, at least in terms of the top spenders. But do you have some sense of that? Is it that Republican candidates are instead putting their money elsewhere? My, my sense is that Democratic candidates were able to raise more money okay. um, on the whole. Yeah. Uh, Republican candidates were much more reliant upon groups to pay for their political advertising. And as we already mentioned today, um, when it's not in candidate advertising, you don't get that special lowest unit rate. Yeah. And so because Democratic candidates were paying more for their advertising, they're getting more bang out of their buck as well. Okay, thank you so much, thanks. And Shannon, I, I'm absolutely 100% with you that what's going on in advertising a lot of the times is about identity and it's so useful to see that empirically, so thank you. I wondered, do you think there's something special about social media that enables candidates to or, or other people to communicate identity or is that going on in television advertising too? television, radio. Yeah. I mean, you know, to a certain extent ads, uh, especially sort of like image ads, if we think of a lot of the classic television ads, I think have certainly been about identity, but I do think there's something special about social media. All of us perform our identities on social media. This is like what we are there for, right? Um, we are really personal. We are choosing and curating like this is who I am, right? And me on Instagram is a little bit well, it's like really different actually than me on Twitter, right? And so I think we have this sort of perfect storm where politics and, and candidates were already sort of trending towards this idea of personalization, right? Of like it being more about the individual candidate and less about issues and parties. And then bam, social media becomes this like really important part of political campaigns, which is also about identity and, and people as individuals. And so I think it has um, certainly exacerbated sort of this uh, movement towards identity, which I just also want to be clear, I don't always think is like necessarily normatively bad. I think it's just a framework that we should be using to be thinking about these things. Okay. Thank you both so much. So there's tons of questions here. So um, I'll get through them as, as, as many of them as I can. Um, and I might in, in the end ask a few of them and then have you re reflect on them collectively and respond. And, and I'll check the time to make sure we don't go over too. Um, but here's the first question. Do you think the social media ads focusing on identity are more or less effective in mobilizing voters? And do you think this type of motivation is good or bad? And I'd say it's probably more geared towards you, Shannon, but I think Travis, you might have insight on that as well. So uh, Shannon, why don't you answer first? Yeah, um, I mean, I think uh, my, uh, educated guess is that they would be more engaging. Uh, this is from um, looking uh, not systematically yet, but at uh, thousands so far of Facebook ads by political candidates. Um, as I think we saw in Travis's data, a lot of it is about fundraising. Um, but the ones that are not that do focus on identity in some way tend to get more engagement, whereas the fundraising ones, it seems to be the strategy more is just like run a lot of them like run a lot of fundraising ads and eventually, you know what I mean? You're going to hit the right person and, and you're going to be able to bring in money that way. Um, and then towards the second part of like, is that good or bad? I'm going to give like a really normal academic answer, which is like, it depends, <laughs> right? Like uh, if people, you know, if candidates are motivating identity uh, in a way that uh, is, uh, I would say pro small D democratic, 
uh, that is making maybe more in group, uh, you know, not attacking an identity, but saying this is who we are or this is who I will represent. Um, you know, I think we can see that in the powerful appeals, for example, uh, of of things like the Black Lives Matter movement and the LGBTQ plus movement have they been represented in po political campaigns for sure. Um, and I think it can be a little bit less good when it's attacking uh, an identity, which is like a group of people. Thank you. Yeah, I guess uh, I think there may be a distinction as we were talking about between the types of identities you'd see focused on mm -hmm. on social media and online advertising because they tend to be more targeted, right? And so it might be more narrow identities. Um, mm -hmm. Jewish Americans, um, people who care about the environment, whereas on TV, oftentimes it's Idaho values or um, middle-class Americans. So much broader identities that are being appealed to. And that'd be an interesting project. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thank you both. So we have a few few more questions um, about just effectiveness of advertising, um, and I think there. I think what I'll do is ask all all three of these, and there may be more. But and for both of you, one of them says it's directed to Travis in particular. But Chan, I'd love your insights on these two. Um, so if Democrats air so many more ads. Why is there no clear advantage or effective impact on election outcomes? Or is there, um, how effective is advertising really? Uh, and, and related to that, what does the data show on, on where media spending reaches a point of diminishing return? So basically, are they effective? At what point are they no longer effective? Um, and do you see a difference between positive and negative advertising or tone that you were you've been analyzing, Travis, when you look at whether uh, a candidate won or lost. So, Yeah, uh, so when I first started studying the impact of political advertising, TV advertising dominated, right? And so one could kind of measure the universe of your exposure to advertising. You know, I won't say it was simple, but there were ways to do that, right? And we found that you know, it varies by the race, but TV advertising can be persuasive at the margins, maybe a couple percentage points, um, maybe a little bit more in down ballot races, less in those races at the top of the ballot. Now, measuring the impact of digital and online advertising is really, 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 really difficult. Um, you know, we we don't have good measures of what people are exposed to in general. Uh, oftentimes that advertising is very targeted. Um, and so, you know, what we can measure though is whether you clicked or you donated money. So we know online advertising can get people to donate money. Um, we know it can get people to submit their email address and their cell phone number. But as far as persuade them to vote a certain way on election day, that's the really, really difficult thing to try to determine. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to that, you're absolutely right in terms of not only like what can we measure when it comes to social media ads, which is like basically data gathering, right? So giving your email or your phone number or giving a financial donation. Um, but I would say the purpose of those ads is actually primarily for that, right? Like the purpose of most social media ads is to get data, to get, you know, to get fundraising dollars. Some of these broader ones, you know, are, are perhaps more persuasive, especially as you think about them, you know, maybe not one single ad, but aggregated, you know, in exposure over the course of, of an election. Um, but I think those those more sweeping narratives, you know, are, are more often in, in some of the like television advertisements, uh, right, like you're talking about. Thank you both so much. So I'm going to take um, one or two questions from online. Thank you to the online audience. Um, and this is with respect to your presentation, Shannon. Um, social media sites track viewers who exit viewing an, an ad before the ad completes, whether or not the social media site allows premature exiting, such as YouTube skip ads button. Do those stats offer any insights or have you had experience with that? 
data? Yeah, I mean, that, first of all, it's really important information that campaigns get when they're running uh, ads in particular, right? Sort of when people are dropping out, same as we can get on sort of websites more broadly. Um, but I, I haven't personally a- analyzed any of that type of, you know, sort of like drop off information. Um, but certainly I've heard from practitioners the complaint that what's being counted as views when they're, uh, you know, using some of these platforms, it's not actually a full view, (laughs) you know what I mean, necessarily. And so um, that's a frustration that I feel like a lot of practitioners, one of many (laughs) that I think practitioners have with uh, a lot of the social and media platforms, which is even for them when they are in the proprietary, you know, when they're in the, uh, their business, right? They're, They're paying for advertisements that they're still not getting the type of data that they would really like to be able to understand how effective is this along the certain lines that, you know, campaigns are often very interested in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, I'll add just a little bit to that, you know, knowing that someone completed watching the ad, that's a good thing. But did your message actually get through? I, it may have even been Joel Rivlin who, who said to me that, you know, you can get people to watch those ads in their entirety if you put cute kittens on that ad, right? Yeah. But does that mean your, your message about voting for me actually makes it into your brain? That's not necessarily the case. Yeah, and I'll just use this to jump on this for a second. Um, I did an experiment in the run-up to the 2020 election with my student, uh, Bridget Barrett, who's on the job market for an academic position. If you're hiring, she's amazing in here or out there. Um, where we showed partisans um, a bunch of different real uh, Facebook ads. So if you were a Republican, you saw uh, Trump Facebook ads that were either fundraising, they were trying to get like your uh, data. So fill out a survey, you know, which is they're just trying to get your data or like a persuasive issue ad um, and Democrats similarly, but for Joe Biden and for control, we used an ad of Campbell's Soup. And we measured whether these ads increase people's propensity to like donate money or to donate their data, basically. Um, And those did work a little bit. Uh, But in terms of favorability and in terms of likelihood to vote, all of the Facebook ads were no more persuasive than a can of soup. So I'll just put that out there. (laughs) That's fascinating. Thank you very much. So here's a question about um, ads on crime. For either of you, was there tracking of ads on crime in particular? And probably more appropriate for you, Travis, but um, so with respect to Wisconsin in particular, our our um, Senate race here, it, it was a big issue in that Senate race. And this person is saying, I feel I mostly saw Johnson's ads as portraying Barnes as soft on crime in various ways. Did the focus on crime vary by state or candidate or any other metric? I, I haven't dug into that specifically, but I think yes. Um, and, you know, and I think that begs the question of how effective were those advertisements? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my intuition is that they were effective in places where people had a lot of concern about crime pre existing, uh, where they could see the deterioration of society in their streets. Um, other places, not so much. Um, we tend to think of advertising as being effective when it keys on something that you already believe, right? And, and it's much more difficult to, to change what you actually believe about the world. Um, and I would say this question is also a really good of example of why I think it's important to look at uh, these ads also through the lens of identity, right? So what you said about crime as an issue and whether it's, you know, salient in your own life is like a hundred percent correct, right? Uh, but these ads about crime are also often about motivating anti-black racism uh, and over, you know, and white fears about black crime. And so I would say that like, the best way that we can understand ads like that is to look at it holistically, right? To look at it as an issue appeal, but also to understand the identity appeal aspect of it. Um, And I think those may be effective on different types of voters, right? Like if you have an ad that appeals to both issues and identities, then you're able to capture voters who are, you know, maybe more politically interested around, you know, actual issues, but you're also maybe able to capture people who are not super politically interested, but, know what they're worried about, right? In a more sort of like gut way that ties into your identity. Thank you so much. I think that the focus on identity in political communication in recent years has been 
really healthy uh, for those of us who spend a lot of time thinking about politics, just to remember and recognize that most people don't, right? And most people are not political beings first, but are very much social beings first. And so this next question is related to that in a sense of you both have, have shown us so much rich data about political advertising, but people are encountering this in, in the midst of encountering all kinds of advertising, all kinds of information. And so this one, I think it's more particular to you, Shannon, but Travis, again, I invite you to answer. How different is the use of identity on social media by political candidates compared to non-political public figures on social media? Well, that's an empirical question that I would love to answer. I have not necessarily uh, explored that. Um, but I do think that, you know, we see that even individuals, um, whether they're elected officials or partisan or not, are increasingly not only performing and communicating their sort of broad identity on social media, but communicating their political identity as well, right? And so I think that we can, we know that people are really responsive to like elite cues. And so if one of the ways that you view yourself is as a Democrat or as a Republican, you're going to be, of course, influenced by the way that like Democrats and Republicans are sort of publicly communicating uh, across different platforms. Um, but I love this question because I think it's really important to point out that none of the things that we've been talking about today happen in a vacuum, right? Like all of these things are sort of happening together. You know, the news media coverage uh, that Grace was talking about, uh, the polling data that Kyle was talking about, the media data, right? Like all of these things are happening in the same environment and no one thing has some causal explanation for why people vote for who they vote for. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Travis, this one's for you. All right. How do you tabulate the digital ads which purport to be a questionnaire and then turn out in fact to be solicitations for money? Yeah, that's that's a, a pretty common tactic we see online, right? Yeah. Just take my little survey or yeah. or or sign up for this birthday card from Melania Trump or whatever it happens to be, right? Yeah. Um, you know, um, in terms of the tech, the technical details of how we do it, we actually look at at the link and whether it goes to a fundraising page or not. Okay. And if it does, then we're able to identify this as an ad that really is seeking money. Cool, thank you, thank you. Here's a question for you as scholars of political communication. Because social media is so fast moving, and I offer this to both of you, how can social scientists produce studies that capture in a timely way post-election analyses that are accurate and comprehensive how do you do your work given that you have such a moving target, both of you? Yeah, uh, it is tough, right? <laughs> and Twitter could disappear tomorrow, right? One of our major new sources <laughs> of data. Um, that said, um, social scientists have also become more adept at computational methods. When I started, of course, we coded all of these TV ads by hand. That's impossible for all of the digital ads nowadays. And so we've got two postdocs right now who have high level computational skills who can help us out. And so I think it is the collaboration across disciplines, uniting people, teams that are tackling this problem that enable us to keep up with the changes, rapid changes in the advertising landscape. Yeah, I mean, I would absolutely plus one to that. I've been, um, you know, exploring now that I've developed this sort of like schema for how to think about online um, uh, political ads through the sort of lens of identity, uh, working with some computational scholars who do like, because a lot of this is in images <laughs> and in videos, right, which are much harder to computationally um, analyze, but we're getting there. So to use some sort of image analysis to get some of that. Um, but I would also say, um, and this is maybe like more directed at, um, you know, the grad students who are, who are listening um, or other academics, but um, I think that all of our research, I mean, obviously I believe in really timely research, um, but I also think it should always be about more than just like 
this particular platform or this particular election, right? Like the, all the findings and the data uh, that the Wesleyan Media Center has reports these things out, but then also is able to tell us so much more about how political institutions, you know, behave and are adapting to like different media environments. And so being able to like abstract it a level out, um, at least for me, is just also motivating when I'm in the grind of trying to get it done quickly. <laughs> Thank you. So here's a question about identity politics and just the, the focus on identity part that you very much illuminated, Shannon, but for both of you again, when and what triggered the transition to transformation um, from issue policy politics to identity politics? And how can we steer it back to policy politics? Um, I would say that at least American politics have been about identity since the formation of our nation. Uh, the realignment uh, of our parties uh, after the civil rights movement uh, uh, up until now, uh, most often we see uh, race, which is of course just one social identity, uh, really precedes partisanship, right? And so I would say that identity has always been central, um, you know, to American politics. I think that we, uh, as sort of a public, have this ideal, and I think it is an ideal, and that's not denigrating it, but I don't think it's one of those things that we may never reach, that politics are more about information and about policy. Um, and I and I do think that we should think more about that. But I, I for me, what would be uh, the most exciting way forward would be to not say either or, but to say, but also. How do certain policies or issues or legislation differentially impact different types of people, right? So like using what we know from identity and identity politics to understand issues and policy in a way that integrates social identity, differences of power, um, et cetera. So I guess I would sort of butt also that question. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I guess I'll beg the question a little bit as well. For about 20 years now, we've been coding the political ads with the question, is this ad mostly about policy or about candidate characteristics or both or neither? And over the past 20 years, we've seen very little change in the percentage of ads, for instance, that focus on issues versus candidate characteristics. So I'm, I'm not sure we're, we've seen a major shift, at least in the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. Very helpful, thank you. And if that's the case, if identity has been a part of politics since the beginning of this nation, why are political scientists, political communication scholars focusing on it more recently? Um, I think because for a very long time, it was a nice story to tell ourselves about us and about ourselves as a country, that if people just had the right information, they would all make the right decisions. Um, and I think that uh, when that has always uh, been a struggle, but when that finally uh, impacted uh, at least the way academics and I think the public and journalists and sort of you know, political thinky people more broadly saw uh, that impacting uh, regular old white people in the 2016 election with the ideas of like disinformation and white identity being salient. Then all of a sudden there was a much greater focus on like, oh, wow, there's something else going on here. Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I think like, as Travis said, the data shows, and, and I would argue historically as well, that this is not necessarily a new feature. Um, but I think for uh, a long time, you know, we were, and I think are still motivated by this I, this sort of like normative ideal, right? That it's about good information. And, um, and I don't think we have to say that's not true, but I think we should grapple with the fact that it's very likely both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, and I could even add academic trends, right? Um, rational voters, rational choice approaches to political science and voters who are calculating. And, you know, that was certainly... Um, <laughs> big at one point, but our discipline has changed as mm -hmm. well and now much more focused on identity. Yeah, and I would say I also think it's preceded by like moving from that like behavioralist perspective, but more to the psychological perspective as well, right? Because we know that psychology is deeply intermingled with identity, right? And so I would, I would imagine that that's, uh, you know, a sort of another academic trend aspect of it uh, as well. Thank you. Related question in a way. Um, kind of raising the possibility of 
even though identity has likely been a part of politics for centuries, um, it's possible it's being used differently in recent years, right? And so this question here is about uh, whether identity-based politics work for persuasion, mobilization, um, both one more than the other. What do we know? I mean, I think that research suggests that um, certainly it works for mobilization, right? Like we see this not, this is maybe outside more of election campaigns, but around social movements, right? Like one of the most successful social movements uh, of modern times is the Black Lives Matter movement. Identity is built like into the hashtag of that movement, right? And it's been a very powerful motivator. But we also saw that as being very persuasive, right? As, as, a, as a sort of rhetorical movement within the larger struggle for racial justice. Um, and so I think outside of campaigns, we have evidence that it can be both persuasive and motivating. Um, and I think that we see evidence uh, also in sort of thinking about it from electoral campaign perspective. Um, this goes back to the sort of temporal sensitivity with, with social media um, posts and analyzing them from campaigns that I was talking about in the beginning. It depends where you're seeing those ads in a part of the cycle, right? Like, in the primary, maybe much more about persuasion, right? Who among this group of conservatives or who among this group of liberals are you gonna choose, right? Identity has been a feature in those ads as we've been looking at them. Um, but once we get more to the general election and certainly when we're getting to uh, closer to voting day, maybe more of a powerful um, motivator to sort of get people out, like uh, about your identity being, you know, salient and something that's sort of either at risk <laughs> or to be celebrated, depending on how the ads are framed. Thank you. Okay. This is, um, well, I'll let you, yeah, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a question that gets us to think about, um, just the, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak as I'll, I'll explain why I'm, I'm pausing. So is there a silver lining to election denialism in that the pushback and volume of election education has had a net benefit in voter knowledge? And I'll explain why I hesitated there. Just that studying what you study, um, you're, you're in a moment where, um, you both probably went into this line of work because you care about democracy and politics. And, um, and I'm speaking uh, like on a personal level too, that um, there's it there, you are probably concerned about the future of this democracy. And um, there is a, a way in which spending your professional life focused on it, like you can never tune it out. Right, you can never turn it off, um, and I would love to hear your response to this question. But also, just more generally, knowing what you know from your research, what do you? What are you most worried about? So I'll ask the question again: Is there a silver lining to election denialism, in that the pushback and volume of election education has had a net benefit? in voter knowledge? So that's the smallish question. The bigger one is like, what, what, what do you worry about? What should we be paying attention to in terms of advertising? Yeah, that's a, a big question. I think I, you know, I think there can be some silver linings to this. Um, you know, I saw an initial study right after the election showing that there was basically a five percentage point mega penalty, um, basically an election denialism conspiracy theory. If you're one of those sorts of candidates, mm -hmm. then it costs you about five percentage points at the ballot box, which suggests there is that at least some voters care about um, the flourishing of democracy in this country, and it is reflected in their voting decisions. And so uh, I guess that's the, the optimistic take that I'd um, put forward. Um, the pessimistic take is obviously you can't take democracy for granted. Um, there's probably no American exceptionalism when it comes to this, right? We can look at other countries around the globe and see that there's a lot of democratic 
backsliding, and we aren't immune to that. So that certainly worries me. Yeah. Um, I guess I would say that my answer to the, the question about the silver lining is that um, I'm not sure, and I think this is borne out in polls and in interviews and in focus groups, that the great many people who espouse election denialism from people to elected officials, information is not at the core of that belief. And I think for a great many people, that is about identity and more information about how the voting process works is not going to necessarily change those behaviors at all. And so I think that's what really worries me, right, is that we cannot come to these challenges that we are having now. You know, you mentioned democratic backsliding. Um, you know, one of the uh, um, you know international organizations that measures this uh, last year listed the U.S. as backsliding uh, for the first time. Um, I mean, they weren't measuring when we were not at all a democracy. Um, but uh, you know, as I think that's really worrisome. And I think that if we continue to think that we can bring information to a battle that's about power and identity and race in a changing country, then we're not gonna have a democracy. And I'm really worried about that. Okay, but you may have seen this coming, but I'm not gonna end on a negative note. <laughs> Travis, you started to speak to this, but now knowing what you know, what gives you hope about the future of democracy in the United States? Did you want to attack? <laughs> sure. As you might have guessed, I'm like a wildly optimistic person. Um, what gives me hope? Uh, Gen Z, like, I don't know if you're on TikTok or not, but like, there are people out there talking about really important things in, I won't curse, in really cool ways. Um, and they're really motivated. Um, and I hope that we don't tamp that out <laughs> in some way. Uh, but I'm really optimistic that uh, the young people that I see in my life, both in the college classrooms that I teach, um, in the friends of my son that I interact with, and the people I see uh, on TikTok, um, care about these things and are kind of not willing to take no for an answer in a lot of these things like are we going to make progress on climate change are we going to make progress on the billions of dollars of student loan debt and we're not going to stop talking about it until we do something about it and that makes me really optimistic thank you i'll add an optimistic note too which is you know there are thousands hundreds of thousands of people out there this year who gave $500, $1,000 to political races in some state across the country because, you know, they could see the stakes of that particular election, whether it's a, a Senate race in Georgia or a Secretary of State race in Arizona, um, people were willing to put their, their money behind their beliefs in order to try to protect democracy. Thank you. Travis Without, Washington State University, and Shannon McGregor from UNC Chapel Hill. Thank you so much. It's just been a pleasure to learn from you. <laughs>